evening, everyone. It's very nice to see you all for uh, Building Stories. This is obviously about a project I'm sure most of you know, have walked past, some of you live in it, many, some built it, some worked on it. Um, we're delighted to welcome you to 66 Portland Place, and this is this idea of the in-person building stories. And each practice or project can think about how they want to talk about it. And tonight it's interesting, people actually live there talking about it, apart from the architect who went, obviously lives there and works there, but we'll obviously see it in a favorable light. Um, we launched this talk digitally as well as in the, in the room, because the idea of this building as we move forward is the talks we are doing can be shared worldwide, with our membership, but also on YouTube. So the debate and the discourse, we've called it the House of Architecture, architecture being obviously a, a broad description, you could call it the House of the Built Environment, but I think it's quite a clunky term. The House of Architecture is about saying the RIBA is a place which is open to discourse, a generous host to people, and a place where you come, like Amin just has sneaking in the back, you come to actually engage listen, learn, and then engage afterwards and, and build. This building used to be really important to a lot of us years ago as a place where we met people and, and built kind of uh, peer groups and, and friendship groups. Um, tonight's about a pretty astonishing building, which you all know because you're here to see it. Um, it's a building I heard about, I saw go up. Um, it's a building that you know had lots and lots of technical challenges and, and some political um, and planning challenges, but I think it's definitely a triumph when we visited it for the Sterling Prize. We were all struck by it, you know, from concept to, you know, deliverability. And I think it's also started to kind of raise a debate that I know has been going on about structure, architecture, uh, low carbon design. I think, Steve, you've talked about a 20 mile by 20 mile by half a mile deep stone quarry that would have once been seen as vandalism but you think can save you know uh, some of the massive problems we all face so I think this is a really important project because it's an architectural delight but also important because it starts to talk about how we think about making and building I think it's also important because the architect um, was client as well and that's an interesting um, other way of thinking about the future and different models of uh, practice um, so First of all, uh, Steve Webb, Creative Director of um, Webb Yates, and um, Pierre Bideau of the Stonemasonry Company will talk about stone. And then Amin, who's joined from Bristol, where he's been presenting um, a project, a 26-story 26 stone proposal at Bristol's Design Review Panel. He can tell us how well it went. Um, you know, he'll, he'll join us, as will those who live there, and we'll have, have a broader conversation and take your questions. But now I'll hand over to um, Steve and Pierre. Thank you. But really what I wanted to talk about was why are we building, or why did we build Clark and with Stone? Why are we interested in building with stone? And um, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is why are we building with brick? Or why are we not building with stone? Why is brick so ubiquitous in London? So I've been kind of looking into this on Google, uh, really deep level of uh, research. This is, a, this is where the earliest bricks were found. It's Tel Aswad near Damascus. And it's a Neolithic Tel, which means that it's a pile, it's not a natural hill, it's a pile of demolition rubble. So a whole series of settlements were built there, mud, mud walls and whatever, demolished over time, and gradually they've built up in level to create this enormous hill. So it's a, just a demolition rubble pile. And there they found the oldest bricks 7,000 years ago. Mud bricks, air dried, why did they use them? So they've got a river there, they've got reeds, they've got mud, and very obvious why you would build in that material and why you would build blocks rather than just building blood, mud walls. But I was thinking, why didn't they build with stone? So geographically, that's located here. That kind of staying down here is a basalt uh, intrusion and up to the north, uh, northwest are some limestone mountains. Why didn't they go and get stone to build with? Well, I think at that time, it's pre-wheel, and it's certainly pre-stone tools. So how would they get there? Who owned the mountains? Why would they do that? So obviously, they build with mud out of the river. In China, 3,000 years later, are the first fired bricks. And so these were excavations that uncovered those. And again, it's near a mountain. So why did they build with stone? There's that energy, and I think Barnabas Calder, the, the architectural energy historian, has a really interesting take on, um, on energy and how the, the study of energy inflects architecture and human history in general. But here, 
to build a mud wall, you need a big fat wall. You gotta dig twice as much hole to make the wall. On the right hand side, you cut down a tree, burn the tree, dig half as much hole, build half as much wall, and let the tree do the work. So it's kind of harnessing the energy of the tree to save the energy of the human. In London, and all throughout history until the beginning of the fossil fuel era, we're building on a very low energy basis. So in London, uh, Tudor buildings are a kind of high tech of their era. You can see all the bracing. They're using oak quite sparingly. They're filling in with horse dung and crap to make the walls white. In between, there are bricks and bits of Cornish ragstone. It's a very low energy form of construction until the Great Fire of London, when it all burns down. Charles II insists that everything after that is built with, with brick or stone so that it's fireproof. So again, why bricks? Why bricks in London? Why were they not bringing stone to London to build stone or stone from Kent? And it's a transportation issue. So at that time, they're beginning to industrialize mining. They bring 15% by volume of coal to London, and they dig up 85% under their feet to make bricks, and they fire them. Bricks become, uh, well, the coal era starts, coal era unleashes huge prosperity, massive uh, explosion in population, and uh, great prosperity, actually, and has brought a lot of, you know, a lot of good to a lot of people, but also has problems. Bricks become ubiquitous, and at this time, they're the finish, they're the structure, they're the sort of thermal mitigation between the inside and the outside. They do all of the jobs that they're supposed to do in the wall of a building in a single, single um, move, and, and they're all over London and many cities throughout the UK. When we split that into a cavity wall, the wall becomes a quarter of the strength. So if you half the width of something, you get a quarter of the strength. Uh, suddenly the wall's not strong enough. The inside leaf of the wall in brick is quite expensive, so we change it for block works. Blocks shrink while bricks expand. So we have to put vertical movement joints everywhere. Bricks are not strong enough in single skins to carry very much load, and so we put shelf angles in every story. Suddenly, this is the solution, because we're culturally attached to brickwork. So I think this is uh, by the team masonry detailing series. You know, this is espoused as a great thing, but I look at that in horror. I'm going to get that wrong. <laughs> Every aspect of it. And, you know, this is what we do to hang bricks off of buildings. And this is a you know, beautiful building by Peter Barber. He's stuck building in brickwork because of planning, right? The planners are insisting that he's building with brick. He's got brick on the soffits of these balconies and... Uh, you know, and I think, why are we so attached to this coal era product? Uh, any more than we want our cars to look like steam engines, why do we want our buildings to look like coal era buildings? Uh, so um, when we're designing, we're thinking about the morality of what we're doing and the, the climate effects particularly. So, uh, it, you know, and there's a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of different ways of working this out, but basically a blast furnace is bad. Pollution, cement works, things that involve fiery processes are not as good as things that are relatively benign and not environing quite so, uh, involving quite so many fiery processes. We take a lump of limestone, 200 newtons, 120 newtons, we crush it, we get a load of gas, we burn it in a cement factory, we batch it with sharp sand and fresh water, we employ uh, formwork, false work, back propping, vibration, releasing agents, uh, whatever, hey presto, 28 days later, we have a piece of concrete with a strength of 40 newtons. So it seems somewhat self-evident that you might just use the piece of stone that you had in the first place rather than do all of those things to use that. This is a quarry in the south of France. Uh, in France, uh, quarrying is actually was um, subvented after the war because of austerity construction. They put a lot of money investing in machinery and quarries and trying to industrialize quarries because they had a shortage of coal, they had a shortage of steel and a shortage of cement. Uh, and so they really promoted steel. So in France, not only is the geology slightly better, but the quarrying industry is more advanced, and they cut out these big blocks. If we look at um, a kind of typical use of a beam, a beam spanning two meters carrying a one-ton car can be any of these section sizes. So an eight-inch by four-inch piece of softwood, narrower bits of hardwood or engineered timber, 2.1 millimeters of steel, 22 millimeters of post-tension stone. These are the carbon footprints for each of those sections. So 22 kilograms per meter for the steel. So even though the steel is tiny and really structurally effective, its carbon, uh, its carbon cost is, is much higher. Timber is about five, but then you get minus 16 because of the sequestered carbon in the timber. But stone is only 
And so stone is actually, in the short term, better than timber because the stone is much stronger. It's already in the ground. You take it up, it has a strength of 100 newtons, whereas trees only have a strength of seven or eight newtons. Somebody asked what happens when all the stone is used up. So we're floating around in space in a kind of constellation of office buildings and work hubs and <laughs> whatever else we're building. If everyone in the world had a five meter by five meter by 200 millimeter thick slab of stone, it would be a whole, so seven billion people, 42 kilometers by 42 kilometers by 20 meters deep. In um, Edinburgh, uh, most of the center of Edinburgh is built with the sandstone. Um, the quarry, the uh, Craig Leith quarry, is under Sainsbury's car park in the middle of Edinburgh. So it's a kind of tiny blip compared to the size of the city. Meanwhile, outside, when you look around Edinburgh, there are big green rectangles of timber uh, forestry, which takes up a lot of room. So comparing quarrying to uh, timber, for example, we, we made up this unit, meter cube newtons per year. So how many meters cubed of what strength you get over what time period? A tree takes 25 years to grow. It's got about one and a half cubic meters of seven and a half newton material in it grows over 25 years, so you get 0.336. Under the tree, 500 cubic meters of 150 newton stone out in three months, 224,000 meter cube newtons per year. So far more effective in terms of land use to get stone from the ground uh, than grow trees. Stone's very strong, much stronger than concrete, much stronger in tension, which is useful. We started post-tensioning stone because rich people were paying us to design stone staircases in their houses, and we were able to dedicate a bit of money to experimentation. This is uh, kind of middle of our stone trajectory, I guess. Um, each piece of, uh, each tread is a lump of stone. There are two cables running through it, post-tensioning it together. We're making beams, so we're putting stones next to each other, and we're putting cables through them and stressing them, and we're looking at slabs and, and columns, different ways of lacing stone together with reinforcement using a little steel and more stone. So we, uh, this is an early failure of a post-tension stair, uh, helical stair, which exploded while they were tensioning it. I don't know whether the explanation is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> something went wrong in the execution. I'm not quite sure what. Uh, but eventually we got that working. Um, we have a, a sort of embryonic R&D program with UCL and uh, Pierre, the stone masonry company, where we're testing beams. Wendell Sebastian from UCL in the middle there. Fire testing, so the stone um, lasts a long time in fire. This, with this beam passed a three-hour test. When you heat up concrete, the water inside the concrete turns to steam and blows the face off the beam. That hasn't happened with stone, and so we get a really good resistance from uh, from post-tension stone. That's one of the earlier stairs. It's actually, there's no human in here for scale, but it's 1.4 meters wide, so it's a really big, big flight. And it's a really succinct answer to that uh, problem. This is the building center. Um, what was it? Back to the Stone Age for a low-carbon future? I forgot what the, what the new Stone Age, that's it. Uh, so we were asked, uh, or Amin was talking to Canary Wharf and discussing what kind of spans they want. They want a 12 meter span. So this is a 12 meter spanning stone beam, 450 mil by 300 mil with two cables in it. It's incredibly easy. It's incredibly simple. It's incredibly easy to make compared to making a steel beam, which has, you know, uh, this one is at the RA at the moment. Um, so this stone is, is reject stone from the Portland quarry or undesirable stone. I don't know whether it's rich. unloved stone. We loved it. Uh, and this was reclaimed granite. Um, but it's a beam cantilevering 5.5 meters with three tendons. It's 90% less CO2 than the steel and hollerib alternative. Yeah, it's a 5.5 meter cantilever. Because you divide the 11 in half. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for your intervention. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we could span it 11 meters. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I'm glad you. Uh, yes. Oh, you're right. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was uh, sorry. I was uh, mansplaining. Yeah. Engineers planning. Um, but what we quite like in this thing is the combination of timber and timber and stone, particularly. And we've been working a lot with timber and, and concrete composites where we're using timber beams and concrete. Um, this is the Anna Freud Center, which has 
this mix of timber and concrete. And what we're really interested in is adding stone into that mix, so taking the concrete out and making uh, stone and timber composite, um, kind of using the different materials together. So this is a sort of prototype experiment, back extension in somebody's house. There's a post-tension stone beam all the way along the back. It's supported on a timber prop on one side. We have timber beams and stone soffits. So, so this kind of combination of, uh, of stone and timber, I think, is really interesting for future projects. And that's why that's, I mean, we're slightly more advanced than we were when we were at Clark and Well, but that's why we were building Clark and Well in, in stone. That's it. So um, I, I'm Pierre Bido. I'm from the Stone Masonry Company. Uh, I'm a stone mason. I've been a stone mason for 30 years. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is, um, whenever we talk about stone, we're going to talk about the past. Um, and it's heavily, heavily, heavily anchored in the past stone. And um, when uh, Steve asked, us, uh, to asked me to do a talk a couple of weeks back uh, about, uh, about stone for, for a project, uh, his, his title was From Bedrock to Town. And I decided to call it Town to Bedrock. And why am I sticking to that title is because I'm a very lazy person and I didn't want to change that. And um, I thought I can't be bothered and here we are. Any good stonemason is a lazy person, okay? Because we are moving big stone, so the less energy we use, the better it is. And nothing, nothing beat the, the nothing and a, a nice summer evening than talking about death. Um, and I thought that to put things into perspective, um, we should talk about ourselves as we are the next strata of, of, of the earth, okay? We are just one strata. One day will be rocks, one day will be fossils, and I think people will understand that, as Steve was talking about, um, we, in a way, stone is totally sustainable, because we are just part of a big circle. And when you look at a, a quarry, when you walk into a quarry, you are suddenly put back to your position as human, into this sort of deep, deep time, as some geologists call it. Um, and yes, we, when John Hutton, the, the, the Scottish geologist, was talking about, about geology, um, it, it, it called geology a sort of, it, it called ourselves, the life on Earth, as a sort of succession of world. And that's very much what we are. When we look at this uh, cephalopod, this ammonite, um, we are just looking at what we are going to be in a few years' time. And there is something always very humbling about stone. Uh, when you walk into a quarry, I would, I would advise anyone to walk into a quarry just to get a sense of, of what mankind, humankind can, can do and what it is. I mean, here you are looking at hey, 135 millions of years of, of, of sediment um, just depositing in, in, the, in the bottom of the uh, ocean. So as, as, as we walk into this quarry, as we work these quarries, um, we've got to look at how much energy, because if something is interesting about I mean's building, is the energy that was put into that building. And in a way, there, is, there were very little energy. When you look at the energy that was taken into this quarry in, 19, in 1860, um, you can see a, a well-organized ecosystem um, where um, you want to move this species of stone from a quarry which are 50 miles, 80 miles away from, from where you are going to feed them, uh, with as little as energy as possible. Okay? Everything is human, so you need to be very careful on how you spend it. And most importantly, as, as you extract this material, you just realize that how sacred this material is. And I think that's something else that was very well thought about uh, Amin's building, is that we try to waste as little as possible uh, material. So, this quarry here in 1850, you got these amazing pieces of stone, which are more or less uh, five meter tall pieces of stone, five meter tall by 400 mil by 400 mil, that came from this quarry 50 miles away. We just went into a boat, got, uh, got out from the boat, and just dragged onto the, into the middle of this uh, city in, in Lyon. Our big message for the last five years is about bringing stone 
not as uh, a luxury, but as a commodity. Stone has been always a commodity, okay? It's the hard work of human who just make it, would sublime it, and will make it affordable or for the shepherd hut, or for the fancy house in, um, in, 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 a, in, a, in a manor place. Um, so this is in Portugal, That's all that is marble, marble from the local uh, marble uh, quarry. It can be, as I say, sublimed by the work of people, of men and women and women. You know, you can do, of course, fancy things in marble, but that's all marble, it's, you know. And that's coming from that quarry. Um, as you can see, the, the quarry are, I've got an aesthetic purpose. I mean, not, not purpose, but aesthetically, I find them because, well, I'm called Pierre, which means stone in French, so I'm a bit biased. At 30 years, I've been working the blooming thing, so I'm even more biased. But there is something like a sort of giant amphitheater, you know, waiting for the next, for the next generation of, uh, of human to, to come and sit on this uh, extra ex extraordinary strata. Um, so you get these big blocks now, you know, as, as we always used to have, uh, these, these large blocks. And for the last 50 years, we've been slabbing it to death, okay? We've done this wonderful uh, material has been just slabbed to death. So I will come back to this slab later, so just, just hang it with me. Um, the, when I show you the pictures of the quarry before, there were a huge amount of people working there. There is all an ecosystem. There is people, men working hard in the, in the quarry, but then you've got women who do the polishing of the stone if necessary, and you had the kids as well doing the polishing and helping the, 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 the working of the stone. So it was a whole ecosystem working. Now for exactly the same quarry, you've got three person, max, working with electric, uh, electrically um, uh, powered uh, saw. Um, and um, that do all the, the very efficient work. Um, here, that's in Portland. And again, you can see, you can, I, I'm usually better at taking pictures, but you cannot see the huge, the huge chainsaw cutting the blocks uh, ready for, uh, for the, the primary saw and then secondary saw. But here, you've got blocks, blocks ready to, 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 to be used as, as, a, as a load bearing material, as a structural material. And if you look at the quarry, just uh, 120 years ago, they were exactly the same blocks, uh, they were exactly the same size, except that these stone were going to be used for building a central, uh, you know, um, downtown Lyon or Paris or Marseille. Um, quarries, they come, you know, as, as you were saying earlier, they come in different sizes, in different shape. Each time there is a, a quarry, a geological strata, there will be a different way of extracting it. Here, it's, it's, we are extremely lucky in south of France. We've got these magnificent uh, pieces of stone. This, to give you an idea, I mean, you can see the, the, the container here, but um, it's uh, 1. 1. 1.6 high by 2 meter long by 600 mil thick, okay? Um, so that's something that uh, some of our colleagues here <laughs> in, uh, in, the, in Portland would dream of, um, you know, such, a, such an incredible place uh, to, to extract stone so easily. Um, and as you look at, uh, at how this stone is installed, this is the Opéra Garnier, uh, in, um, Opéra Garnier in, in Paris in uh, 18, uh, 1880, a uh, photo taken by Durandel. Um, and that shows you the sort of usual, uh, of usual setup of, of cranes uh, operated by man. But if you look at a project that we are doing at the moment here in the UK, you could see exactly the same setup. You know, it hasn't changed. There is just less people, of course, and bigger crane and much more efficient crane. So again, there is very little difference um, in, the ener I mean, in the energy spent. There is more or less the same amount of energy. When we were talking about, uh, sorry, when we were talking about um, material as a, you know, s architecture is, is, is about context, of course, but it's a, as well for material, it's about circumstances, okay? So just after the war in, 19, in 1950, the, the French government asked the, um, the, quarry, um, uh, the, uh, the quarry owners to develop a system to provide a huge amount of stone for the, the reconstruction of France, okay? 1946, France is on its knees. There is no more well tracks. There is, um, there is no, more, uh, no more concrete. It's very expensive to get, very little steel. So the quarries are asked to produce uh, incredible amount of stone every month. In south of France, one quarry used to provide 10,000 cubic meter a month. 10,000 cubic meter a month of stone. You know, that's, 
That's pretty incredible. Um, but they, they did it. It was, it, of course, the government was um, was giving some money to to help uh, de devise this new uh, this new product. I mean, this new way of cutting stone. Um, and yes, if if you look at you know in the last one thousand years or two sorry two thousand years, you can see our stone as little by little as you were showing before, Steve, has totally disappeared to to become very much a sort of veneer. And um, there is, of course. As I was saying about slabs, we, we just slab everything to death uh, at the moment. Beautiful limestone. And all that is coming from, <laughs> from uh, of course, an architect that I like very much, but would just change the way we saw stone. We just saw it very much as, as a veneer, as even a wallpaper. And um, just leaving, leaving, leaving being there just for being so, so beautiful. And, and of course, it becomes uh, in France the, a, a huge, um, uh, a huge way of cladding. Uh, it became even, you know, cladding anything. Um, I remember, you know, it's, it was butch, um, butcher shop, uh, bakeries. Everything was cladded in 30 mil stone. And of course, uh, oh, I've got nothing against 50 years old man doing, doing pizza. It became, of course, the worktop. You know, the famous worktop, um, where um, all our bill of stone just became just very much just a sort of luxury, semi-luxury product. And, you know, I'm talking about my Ammonite at the beginning, and I was thinking, you know, have I died just for that? Just for pizza making? Or just as I'm, as I'm lingering in my, uh, in my bath, uh, thinking, am I, got, am I getting too sedimental? <laughs> sedimental? I just, you know. No, it's not me, no. Well, I, 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 yes, yes. <laughs> and so, surrounded by my travertine, my travertine bathroom, I'm just thinking, is it, you know, is it, was it worth that for? Was it for that? And uh, then Amin came. I don't have pictures of Amin in his bathroom, just thinking deeply about the, the, the resurrection of stone, but at least I've got this beautiful uh, poetic uh, view, and I think poetic is very much something that about Amin's building, uh, po poetic view of, of uh, William Blake uh, uh, illustrating one of his poems. And I think the resurgence of the simple triliton, simple architecture of, of just two jams and a, and a lintel are, are great. Um, you know, you see, you see here, uh, I think I'm going, yes, I'm going okay for time. Uh, Steve is going to scream at me. Um, but uh, here you can see the, the, I'm sure you will see some pictures uh, of, the, um, of the work taking place in, um, in the quarry for Fifteen Clear Kenwell. Here you can uh, see one of the, the pieces put in place. Um, and um, again, a very easy way to fit, sto to fit, the, to fit a, a stone um, uh, and <coughs> Um, yeah, that's that the result of all the team's work. So, uh, yes, it's pre-assembled uh, with very low uh, texture. Um, you know, we, we just we just um, we decided with with I mean just to cut price and to make to make the project uh, a lot more affordable to avoid any over um, over polishing or over uh, over overwork. So this is just the the wire the wire in the quarry just giving that fantastic shape. In France, uh, there is a huge uh, amount of work do being done in load-bearing stone, reintroducing arches all in load-bearing stone. It's uh, being used for affordable housing here in Switzerland, if there is such a thing as affordable housing in Switzerland. Um, so all in load-bearing stone. Again, an incredible uh, project by Atelier Perrodin. Uh, here, that's the inside, completely left, uh, completely raw, um, just... Um, you know, um, a very simple way of, of architic articulating a stone. And another, so it could be a school in France. Um, we are working on hybrid structure with Steve. Again, that's that's learned from all the the the, the lesson from 15 Clerk and Well Close. You know, basic stone skeleton, then the CLT put uh, as a boxes inside the, the skeleton. Uh, I will pass that, that's a stone, that's more stone. Um, that is the assembly line that we are producing at the moment, all our pre-assembled project, all our pre-assembled uh, members, so that to, 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 speed, to, to, um, to speed up the process of the, of the fitting on site, uh, as well as speeding up the process of me talking. Um, so here we've got pre-assembled uh, beams with connection box to, to make it the, the connection between members a lot easier. Uh, here is the mock-up for uh, another project of ours. And um, of course, any, any stone building is an open quarry. You can reuse, you know, tomorrow, uh, thank God for that, uh, maybe in 100 years we can dismantle uh, Clark and Well Close, sorry to tell you that, uh, and, and, be, and be reused very simple with very little, um, with very little energy. 
Um, and yes, we can produce and we can carry on producing an amazing structure here, a brand new um, funicular arches for uh, market in, in, in France, uh, all in load bearing stone. So I just finish it by just saying that um, you cannot get uh, blood out of a stone, but you can surely, with a lot of sweat, get some incredible buildings. And so here we are, we are back, you know, um, after uh, we are back here as, a, as showing the very uh, and beautiful way of organizing strata in our buildings and our life. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pierre. Thanks, Steve. There is an opportunity, as that was a sort of essay in the 42 kilometer by 42 kilometer by 20 meter deep stone thing, and a sort of homage to stone in for its material qualities. Are there any questions in the audience before we go into the uh, Clark Moore Close story about the, the more general use of stone? Yes. Um, can someone yeah, come with, a, with a speaker? If you can introduce yourself if you want to, but remain Hello, anonymous. Hello, um, I'm Ella. Um, I was just wondering, I have heard before that uh, quarrying isn't great for the ecosystems around it. Um, and I did like your touch on how quarrying kind of represents um, an amphitheater, and I was wondering whether there's any potential use for um, once a quarrying site's finished, what you can do with it after that. So um, for open cast, uh, open cast quarries, for example, um, they are rewilding, of course. There is, um, there is using as a um, um, freshwater reservoir. Um, uh, in China, for example, there is several projects where it's being um, uh, reused as a museum or as a hotel. I think it's um, uh, Grimshaw Architect who reused a quarry uh, in, um, in Wales for the Eden project. Um, so uh, as uh, on, on, on mines, for example, mines, there is plenty of things that you can do in, 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 mine, um, in mine quarries. You can grow mushroom, uh, famous uh, mushroom of uh, Paris which might become one day mushroom of Portland. Um, you can age cheese, though you, you, I, you can see the French side in me. But as well, uh, Mr. Mr. Gates and Bezos uh, love it to, uh, to put their servers, to cool them down. Uh, so that's another way as well to, to, use, uh, to use quarries or mine. That, that question comes up as well as, can we run out of stone? I think Steve's answered that effectively, the Earth's crust is all pretty much stone. The magma that's coming out is fresh stone all the time. But, but also you get the question, oh dear, aren't we going to get lots and lots of quarries if we go from steel and concrete to stone? I mean, ultimately, the question is never binary. It's not about eliminating steel and concrete altogether. It's about diminishing it, thinking carefully of whether your building actually needs it. And think about steel. It doesn't just suddenly arrive. You have to mine the iron ore. It takes about seven quarries, including coal, to make a piece of steel. Uh, con concrete, well, you have to uh, quarry the stone, the limestone to start off with. And as Steve points out, you're taking that limestone, crushing it, burning it, uh, uh, and then losing 60% 60 60 of, the of the strength. And what do you do with, with the concrete? You have to put steel in it to bring the strength back up. So that's several quarries for the concrete, plus another nine to put the um, strength back in. So if we can, it's, it's not about um, eliminating it all, it's just diminishing. Maybe, if, see, if I could pick up, because when I, I read that thing, which is why I mentioned it, I got the dimension wrong, but now I've learned it. Have you done the comparison with the same delivery of a forest or, or, or yeah, but it's, it's, to me, it seemed remarkably, it was, you got a five meter slab of stone per person to represent the idea of a lifetime's construction, I assume. It seemed to be an incredibly small quarry it's you know it, it, it's a large city, but that was for the residents of the current population as we stand now, whatever number that is. And have you done the, the you know the, the the mining of the iron ore and and, and the making of concrete, uh, or the forest? Because you know we, we get these trends: oh, steel bad, you know, concrete bad, timber good, timber not so good, depending on sequestration. Have you done, or are we just in the early days of the cartoons? Um. Yeah, we're definitely in the early days of the cartoons. <laughs> I think my presentation is sort of glib statements, but the point is that geological volumes are massive compared to 
what we can consume in building the you know geology is huge mm -hmm. and it's all basalt and it's all granite um, uh, we dig out earth for basements you know we dig it out in far more abundance than or moving earth around sites we yield more clay and and um, spoil from sites than we would ever need to produce in stone so if you dig a quarry fill it up with mud afterwards um, I think concrete certainly I mean concrete comes out of the ground in exactly the same constructible volume as as stone you use less stone than concrete because the stones a bit stronger uh, the stone should come from local sources and and be very you know lightly transported um, whereas obviously steel comes from the Amazon or Australia or wherever so it comes from a long way away I, I think steel is probably a smaller volume concrete is the same uh, concrete requires a huge amount of energy in the processing but as I said forestry and I love timber and I really you know I like working with timber but I think forestry occupies a lot of land and monocultural forestry is not great for the environment and actually uh, the photo that um, Pierre was showing of the sort of Minecraft world of stone cubes under some woodland you can just see how powerful the material is under the trees compared to the trees themselves and so um, I mean you know, a better answer, and not a great one for all of us in this room, is don't build. But if we are going to build, we should be building with high strength materials that require little carbon to process. And uh, that's the central point. Okay. Is there, before we invite Amin to talk about the pro oh, another question there. Thank you. Um, with your, um, your beam at the RA, you were dealing with composite materials uh, with some uh, recovered uh, granite and. Uh, I forget the others. Uh, what other composites are you looking at, and for what use? So we're—I mean, so I'm really. So we've been pushing stone for ages. We also design in timber. Um, we've been trying with Amin many times to build stone towers with timber floors, and not always uh, very successfully for various reasons. But um, I think a really interesting solution is a mixture of timber and stone. As I was saying with that back extension project. So we've been doing some tests of timber beams using stone on top as a composite material. So it's analogous to a steel beam and a hollow rib deck, but a timber beam and a stone deck, uh, being a kind of Tudor version of a, of a 90s office building. Um, and I think that's, that's a really interesting low energy combination. You use the timber where it's best and use the stone where it's used, the stone in compression and the timber in tension. Um, so we're kind of experimenting with that. We have a few projects where we're actually building with that at the moment. And we, we have, in our office, we have, everything from back extensions to massive art centers. So we're quite able to try something out on some unfortunate person's back extension <laughs> a few times before we kind of graduate it to bigger jobs and actually move it from project to project and, um, and, and kind of learn about those ideas before we let them loose on big things. But we're thinking prefabricated cassettes of timber beams with stone stuck on the top is a really efficient, quite shallow, fire resistant, very low carbon way of building uh, floors as an alternative to CLT. CLT is the ubiquitous answer in, oh, low carbon, is that CLT? Oh, well, yeah, we just order some CLT in. And it's like, it's, it's not a binary choice between concrete and CLT. Actually, there are lots of options. Okay, we've got another question just there. Thank you. Yeah, uh, hi there. I just wonder, as the as the ambition grows and the projects get bigger, um, how the how you found the construction industry and the contractors uh, responding to the, these your ambition uh, is is the is the skill there? Um, I imagine we don't have as many great stonemasons as Pierre, or they're, they're few and far between. So it's really interested to hear how you found it when when it gets to the trying to deliver. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Amin because I think he, no, wants, to, no. he wants to scream <laughs> to the <laughs> microphone. It's it's it took us a while um, to um, to persuade the design team. So that's QS uh, uh, in the main and project manager, uh, and then clients. That took a while. Yeah, uh, it's it's doable. It's ancient. It's doable. It's been around. Don't worry. It's uh, it's going to work uh, structurally and cost wise, etc. Okay, let's go for it. Uh, you tender, uh, and then main contractors. If you t tender it traditionally, main contractors will go, oh, uh, oh, I haven't done it before. I'm one of the lists that the QS has um, put together. I won't ramble on too long, um, but um, I'm just, just hear me out. This is how to avoid that. Yeah. 
uh, they all come back at some incredible amount. But Pierre, you told me, it's only going to cost this much. And Pierre's looking at the figures thinking, well, I mean, it's not, they, they haven't increased my bit, they've just added risk money because they've never done it before themselves. On every single aspect, whether it's the timber, the stone, and all the rest of it, we've gone out and put all those components together. And actually everything, literally from piling all the way to the, the roof, the window systems, the I interiors, we've got all those component prices. So we know what it should cost. Why is it any more than 25% overheads, premiums, and profits? Because of risk. Uh, uh, so, which is totally legitimate if you're a main contractor and you've never done it before. So tender out to somebody who just wants to manage it, the overheads, premiums, and profits. Again, it's going to be a risk to them. We found it's rather, rather painful. Even when they've said, we'll do it for this much, they're quickly going back to the client. <laughs> I won't be too specific, because Steve's just giving me that look. Because <laughs> I'm the sort of person that gets shot and ends up in the ditch dead, while Steve marches on and carry, <laughs> carries on with the project. Um, uh, 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 even after they've said they will do it for 25% overheads, premiums, and profits, they will go back to the client and say, oh, well, actually, we've got a, a, a concrete guy who'll do it for less, yeah? And that's what they say. And you're looking at the figures, and you're thinking, well, I, I don't believe it, but what the hell? I'm not going to force the client to, to spend a bit more if they can prove it's for less. And of course, what happens? They go on site, oh, we didn't realize this complexity. Oh, we didn't realize that. And suddenly, it's three times the amount that the original stone and timber version cost. You're scratching your head thinking, well, how did this happen? And then eventually one of the contractors tells you, why do I want to give all my money to, to directly to a subby, whether it's Pierre or timber guy, when I actually keep quite a lot of the concrete money myself? Yeah, Because I can do the concrete myself. I'm just ordering the, the supply of it, and I do the rest. I don't, you know, and what about the planet? Oh, I'll leave that to my kids. And that's really what they answer to us. So it's highly frustrating, and you have to navigate that. I'm unfortunately hit that cost and ma that management. I'll stop rambling and. Um, okay, I'm gonna. Um, Sorry. Yeah, go, go on. Yeah, just one then thing. I'm going to introduce some means to give his talk. Yeah, yeah, then yeah, we no, have no. some more questions at the end. Yeah, yeah. just one second. I, I think it, it's uh, it's down to the stone industry to pivot now from this sort of slabbing uh, industry to a more load bearings and uh, load bearing structure. So th there is a possibility, and we can scale it, scale this this uh, industry with no problem. And um, and yes, and even so, us we are thinking of doing main contracting as well because we, we might want to to do and the stone and the wood, and so to avoid this sort of problem. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. So Amin's going to stand up and talk about the project, which you've, you've come Hello. to see. Um, I don't know why he's asked me to introduce it, because I've always liked the project, because um, our office is around the corner. I, mean, I still walk home past it, and Amin showed me round it before, and then again when it's up for the Sterling Prize. But I, I must make a confession that the person who uh, objected to his project um, worked in my office, and one of the contractors he's slagging off is one of my best friends who I go running with. Okay. However, I have every enthusiasm uh, for this project. I wasn't even going to bring yeah. that up. <laughs> I have every enthusiasm for this project, not just as a story about low carb design or innovation by iteration, but also the actual quality of the project in the city, how it presents itself, the story behind it, and actually the poetry of, of the life within it, which we will hear about um, at the end from An Anton, who will join us um, in the panel. But over to you to tell us more. Thank hello, you. Hello. Right. So what well, we start off with is a photo of context as the built, the built scheme in its context. Some of you will know this area, some of you won't. But have a look at the context. So the context is mostly brick, but everything you're looking at is post-war from 1970s onwards. Some of it obviously less so. This stuff on the left-hand side is actually close to what, it, what was there originally. Concrete frame by one of our ex-presidents, actually, here, yeah, who will remain nameless, ex-presidents. Um, and this is all steel frame. This is concrete frame again. And most of us will know when we see stretcher bond with wee poles that it's actually being held up by, by um, um, shelf angles. Uh, why is it all here in this sort of manner? Because Islington is one of those first boroughs that created a conservation area. This is conservation area number one with conservation area guidelines. And remember, at that period, this is the 70s, 
um, uh, there, there's um, a, a language that they haven't actually changed in Islington yet, but other boroughs are beginning to change, which is conform, uh, fit in uh, with the predominant material. Now, Clerkenwell originally was limestone and then timber and some brick, so lots of brick. Um, and what effectively you, you end up with is a sort of um, a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of brick, post-war brick. That's the, literally the, the context as we normally understand as architects and uh, urbanists and even, I guess, lay people. The physical two-dimensional things we see in the street, as it were, uh, fit in and respect, conform, etc. Well, I mean, you know, socially, if we had to fit in with something that's quite intellectually insulting, would we want to do that? Would we want to conform to that? Well, I think probably not. So we challenge that. We, we've been working with that case officer who, on this particular project for about 10 years in the area, so he knew we probably wouldn't do this sort of thing, and he asked us to develop some schemes. Ultimately, he initially said, look, it's up for demolition. English Heritage have surveyed the building and said it's not adding any quality. Neither are these. You can demolish, rebuild, uh, taller, bigger. It had one flat, some office space. We've increased the office space and then got eight flats instead of the one. Um, history. So I can actually point on this one. So that's Smithfield up here. You can just see that clock and walk close there outside the city walls. It's the first area that was built by the Normans post-invasion. Uh, nothing here apart from farmland. And what they found was some stone quarries that were supplying the city. Uh, one of the first companion barons built um, a, 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 a nunnery and then um, a monastery here for the hospitaliers. And it th uh, thrived for about 500 years until until um, Henry VIII had dissolved it with the Duke of Norfolk, who turned it into his palace. Uh, Elizabeth I cut off her, uh, his son's head after he, um, he uh, conspired against her, broke up the land into smaller sections, it went off to noblemen, they part demolished the, the, the abbey uh, and built other structures on top until he um, uh, Olive Cromwell uh, uh, dissolved the monarchy took the land for himself and built a nice brick, what was called a palace, but really it was a, a building of state. Uh, uh, restoration of the monarchy, they took the land off him, noblemen came back with their deeds, demolished his structure, uh, rebuilt houses for rent, which effectively became, by the time the uh, Victorian period arrived with its um, industrialization and uh, increase in population became slums. So some of you will know that the area is characterized in Dickens, um, uh, uh, in Oliver Twist uh, uh, as, uh, as rookeries. This, this, is a, this is a printing press, 20th century printing press, which is actually William Morris's, our buildings just behind there, or our sites just behind there. And William Morris hired Marx and then eventually Lenin uh, used it for, for printing too, for his uh, Russian language paper. And to this day, it's, it's still the sort of center of radicalism. I mean, some of you will know this stuff for Clarkenwell anyway. That's our first scheme. So our first scheme was not to be literal in terms of, um, <laughs> I can see some of you raised eyebrows. Uh, it was not to be literal. It, well, actually, it was literal because we were on the site of some of the timber buildings, not the stone buildings or in, within the nunnery, half timber frame structures. And initially, we were thinking, well, we hadn't played with any elevations, we just looked at the principle of what, what could be done on the site. How can we allude to what might have been literally there, a sort of half, half timber frame structure? What are half, tim half timber frame structures apart from exoskeletons in timber? Should we make it out of timber? Should we make it out of something else? We'd actually been... <laughs> I'm looking at Steve because he won't remember <laughs> exactly. We'd made a bookshelf out of metal, a bookshelf that was a story and a half tall that had to have a bridge on it a landing and a staircase. So it was quite a big, beefy bit of metal bookshelf. And um, <laughs> someone's still recording it for posterity. Um, and uh, I, I looked at that bookshelf and thought, good God, any bigger, it's going to hold up a whole building. So at the back of my mind, I was thinking, half timber frame structure. Most buildings are going to be steel frame. We're going to end up with a unitized glazing system. And the strange thing is you draw all that stuff. And even when it's glass to glass, it's actually back painted, you know, when the lights are on at night, 
that, that metal behind the glass is that big, and you have really drawn that in your elevation. It's quite powerful uh, in, in terms of its um, uh, final resolution. So we worked with Mark Day, who is his project um, engineer, who had a bit of software, I can't remember what it's called, Tropical Island or something. Excel. <laughs> Excel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could remember. I just, all I remember from this, you have to Oasis. remember. Oasis. Oasis, thank you very much. <laughs> well remembered. This is, so remember, this is about 2011. It's more than, more than 10 years ago. Uh, 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 yes, Oasis, and um, uh, it, the software effectively, I mean, this is the way Mark would sell it, is AI, I mean, it's AI parametric, you, you, whatever you like, it's in it. <laughs> and all we said was, look, more than likely it's going to be a steel frame with a unitized uh, 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 frame um, glazing system. Can you add all that metal and find out what would happen? Is it going to be an excess skeleton? What happens to all that metal? Can we reduce the quantity of metal? And his software said, yes, it should be an excess skeleton. It can be a really thin plate, and you're probably going to reduce the metal about 20 to 30%, depending on how many of these diagonals we put in. And if you look carefully, it's quite modulated in, in, in its section and plan. Uh, uh, the software effectively says where the load path is on that, on that, on that, um, on that elevation. Yeah? So it's engineering driven to a large degree with then an architect placing a, a diagonal here and there, and that immediately either um, shrinks or expands uh, in, in plan and section. I'm rambling on a bit about this, but it's critical. Because we presented that, and the, and the, the logic to it, it's reduced the amount of steel. Yeah. Uh, we're very proud of that. It sort of alludes to half timber structures. A case officer loved it. I love it, I mean, I love it. It's great, well done, again. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, just wait. The conservation officer who's new to the borough, he's a bit late, he'll be in any moment. Bang, the door flies open, holding our um, uh, pre-app document. Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't got a clue what on earth this is about. W why are you making the, the building look like this? In the conservation area guidelines, it says use predominant materials. In this borough, it's all stone. I was thinking, oh my God, what's he talking about? Uh, uh, I don't understand it. Give me an Eric Parry any day of the week. Do me an Eric Parry and I'll give you approval. Bang! And off he's gone. <laughs> Case officer and the rest of us around the table thinking, well, oh, that was strange. And uh, he's saying, just ignore him. We'll press ahead for this. Go to committee, press ahead for this. I'll give it approval. We're scratching our heads thinking, well, we know what that's like. You go to committee. The conservation officer is going to have written some terrible um, text about how this doesn't fit in, doesn't conform, etc., etc. Why bother? Why bother? Because they're going to err on the side of caution. And quite honestly, um, we don't have any prejudices against different materials. Predominant materials actually brick, not stone. But let's have a look at stone. Let's let's see whether we can do it. So remember, about 2011, this was. But this is how we build in stone, isn't it? It's a veneer, and uh, you know we've worked in practices where. Where, where, you know, as a young, young, young graduate, you're um, coordinating all this. Wherever the window is, wherever the door is, every time there's a change, oh my God, I've got to re-coordinate the whole lot. And as Steve says, oh bugger, it's bound to fail. Might be a contractor design portion, you might leave it to the contractor and not do a lot with it. <laughs> Nevertheless, you sort of scratch your head and think, really? Uh, you know, I can remember driving several times past a, past a building, I won't mention, uh, who they are, but um, driving past, I think it took about a week for a team of two or three guys to veneer a column with this stuff. And you think, can't be, it can't be the most sensible way of putting it together. Now, at the back of our minds, we were just thinking, well, embodied carbon's bound to be a little bit of a saving, bound to be a cost saving and time saving, though. So th you can see where the priorities originally were. And uh, Pierre was tendering on a staircase. See where it all started, staircases. <laughs> and uh, we were all sitting around the table, Steve and Mark Day and the quantity surveyor saying, um, right, can we do it in another way? And Pierre came in on another project and waved him over and said, come over, we're trying to make this thing of stone. We don't want to make it like this. And he, he just looked at us and, and, um, and uh, you know, are you stupid? What do, what do you mean? Of course you can make things out of stone. What do you think we've been doing for the past 2,000 years? The period of steel and concrete in that timeline is this, yeah? Of course you can do it. 
just give me the quantity in cubic meters and I will give you a price for supply and delivery and erection on site. Yeah? Well, that's easy enough, okay. QS knows how much the steel frame cladding it is. Steve took the software, uh, Tropical Island, punched, <laughs> punched the numbers and uh, came back with cubic meters because it did exactly the same thing. Each column and beam uh, must be of a certain scale worked out the cubic meters, Pierre came back and in front of the quantity surveyor told us the price and we just had to have poker faces on because it was considerably cheaper than a steel frame with cladding until a main contractor got hold of it and then suddenly it was double the amount which is why we then, you know, me being the client having been persuaded decided, you know what, I'll project manage it. How, ca how hard can it be to project manage it? <laughs> Very hard. You don't really, you don't really <laughs> I'd rather not. <laughs> you can see, yeah, it's left, best left to others, but you learn, it's not impossible. Those people who are qualified and have a passion for project managing things on site, programming when to order something in advance so it doesn't come end to end and double the period on site, uh, you know, let them, let them have it <laughs> and pay them 25%, but not more. So it was possible. And Pierre said, come with us to France, because actually we went to, and I don't know if he's here, where's Mr. Eh? Where is he? Michael. Michael. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was Michael originally, because actually we thought, oh, we'll go to Portland. You know, we, we just remember the Nor Norma Foster's um, British, uh, um, British Museum controversy of using French limestone instead of British. So we went to Portland, and uh, I'm not sure if it was you, Michael. You probably don't want to confess. You're, you're just shaking your head. <laughs> went to Portland, uh, and, uh, uh, and the response from the project architect who went down there was... Um, from the person who spoke to Project Architect was, oh yeah, yeah, we can give you some stone, just drill a hole in it and put a steel, be you know, steel column and uh, you'll be done. Yeah, no, we want to use it for structure. No, 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 no. Three generations of just cutting stone, got no idea about structure. We don't really have the equipment to tell you that it's structurally capable either. Why don't you just follow the limestone bed under the channel back into France? You know, everybody puts these national flags in. The reality is, this stuff was created 250 million years ago where the equator is. And it's taken the last few hundred million years to sort of shift its way, and people have stuck these national flags in. Just forget it. Just go to France, find out how old the stone is opposite, on the church opposite, has it got fossils in, it might be 250, 600, or 100 million years old. The younger it is, more likely it has fossils. Otherwise, the older it's right at the bottom, and the fossils are all being crushed out of it. So off we went on a tour found out the strength we wanted. Pierre quickly shortlisted those quarries we're going to visit. He took us on a, on a wine cheese tour, occasional bit of stone. <laughs> so you can imagine at the end of all that, <laughs> we were just saying yes to everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, and we found uh, different types of quarries and you know, it's our first time in a quarry, proper quarry. So we thought they're all like this, they're not. This is dare I say, almost artisan farmer. Most, most quarries have just got giant machinery that cuts clean blocks straight out. And people keep saying, oh, well, you know, I don't want to end up with a building that looks like Clerkenwell. Is that, is that the choice that we've got if we're going to go for stone? No. This is a sort of artisan quarry you have to really look for to find. I don't know why PF took us there straight away, but <laughs> poss I don't know, possibly cheaper. That's the best cheese and wine in the area. Well, there you go. Now we know. 12 years later. <laughs> um, and you see here, that, that line there is created by this machine, which is just literally a giant cheese cutter, a wire with industrial diamonds on it that rotates really fast. So by some, I, don't, I still don't know how they do it, but they drill a hole, a vertical hole over here, and a horizontal hole and pass the cable through and, and, and pull it through. How do they do that? <laughs> yeah. Okay pull it really, f they rotate it very fast and pull it and it creates these th 30 meter, 20 meter long cuts. And then they use a, a vertical machine drill to split it. Occasionally a block falls out, not quite right, and they'll, they'll use the old hand tools. So in this type of quarry, you get three minimum type of finishes that come out. The saw cut, and you can see there, there's the, the wire. Because it's a sedimentary stone, it's not granite, it's a limestone. You get a sedimentary layer, and then occasionally the drilling. So that's the minimum finishes that come out of that particular type of quarry. And of course, the occasional ammonite shell and fossils, 
or quartz pocket. Next, how do we put it together? So again, it's the first time we're all learning. This is you know, 10 years ago, we're all learning. Since then, we've simplified this because actually about a quarter of the price of, of assembling all this is in that. Yeah? So if you can simplify that, slowly but surely you'll, you'll bring the price down. Uh, and what's going on? Uh, steel and, uh, sorry, um, beam and post, we cut a pocket out. That pocket is just grout. So there's no uh, pinning or anything. It's just grout putting it into place. Why grout? Because we haven't cut it absolutely perfectly. You need 100% purchase. And if it's not perfectly um, aligned, you'll get an eccentric load and you'll split the stone. So you put some grout in there to get 100% purchase. Those two bolts there connect back into the slab. That is already cast in and threaded into the reinforcement, but you need a thermal isolation layer. So that's what that is here, a um, 40 mil or thereabouts um, nylon plate. You can see there, cast in. Again, it's the first time we did it, so we'd forgotten the IKEA rule, put some sort of notation for the contractor, which way around it is. He got about 20 of them, wrong way around, had to kangle them out and put them back in. These just come into position, I think, ever, I don't know how quickly it took you to do one floor. No? <laughs> All right. The so the, the, the site started in, uh, just on site was end of January, and we handled uh, uh, mid, uh, mid June. Okay, so, the, yeah. The, the, the so call it six months, yeah. Less than, yeah. Less than six months. Okay, so there's the exoskeleton, which basically means, um, uh, uh, you know, you get a, you, a column-free uh, um, floor plate back to the, uh, um, spanning back to the core. So you can do what you like in the long term, you know. I won't labor the point about loose fit, but it's part of being sustainable. You can do what you like with it in the future. Subdivide into smaller rooms, hotel, office space, and all the rest of it. All you end up with is a riser, I think, about there, and two in this location. Um, why uh, uh, exoskeleton though? Well, if you look carefully, the exoskeleton obviously leaves a gap. Leaving a gap means you don't have to do any more to the stone. Because if you wanted to put a window into every opening, you obviously have to weather that threshold, don't you? And that means you have to work vertical, horizontal, all the way around to make sure you get a nice seal. And then in addition, you're, you're effectively creating a cavity. You have to create a cavity on the inside of that potential weak points, potential loss of heat. So if you create a separation, a working separation, enough to get a curtain wall in, it's a fairly inexpensive curtain wall because really the, f the, the structure is doing the facade. Put a curtain wall behind, you get a nice seal, weathered seal all the way down. As it happened, we actually put timber in. We experimented with timber and about, um, I don't know, 25%, 30% of the facade is actually timber insulated timber panels open and close. Uh, Anton can tell you <laughs> how marvelous they are. <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> I find them laughable too. <laughs> uh, there you go, you can see the timber panels there. Uh, so, uh, uh, really the architecture, um, um, it dare I say, the art, why is the architect done? It's the skill of the quarry master in, in extracting the stone, the stone macing and cutting the pockets, assembling it on site, and the engineer sizing which stone beam column is of a particular size. So what's the architect done? We've done nothing else, really. We're quite happy with that, the idea of, of leaving it to these skills. I mean, there's a long tradition of that it, anyway, isn't there? But we did end up having to do something because somebody pointed out, project architect Dominic pointed out, look, it is a trabeated structure, three types of finish, if we leave it to Pierre and scaffolding in front, we won't find out until the scaffolding is gone what we end up with. And I'm hoping I don't see any. But I said, let's just color code it and throw it on the, um, on the table and then rearrange it and see what happens. <gasps> see, I told you, I mean. I said, I don't know. Oh, my God. There's three swastikas across the facade. <laughs> <laughs> so then Pierre said, I will tell you two weeks beforehand how to, where, what, what, what finish comes where and you can turn it through 180 degrees, that's all you can do. So two weeks before, which is part of the controversy, of course, because our case officer said, oh, okay, I understand, sign it all off, but there's no drawing, there's no record saying exactly which finish is gonna be where, because none of us had a clue. He buggers off, 
um, new, new people arrive, eventually somebody complains about it, and of course there's no record saying which stone is going to be where. And that originally was the complaint, and then eventually they decide that's not strong enough, but that's going to be another conversation. Let's, let me mar march on. Somebody asked the question, and I'll elaborate on that. So that tells you the story of, you know, as you're approaching the building, this is what the building's about, sort of slightly pedagogic. It's slightly labored in terms of, my God, this is how we used to build. Uh, this is how the Normans built. This is how the megalithic built. This is what architecture is. The original stone and, and brick buildings around us, as Steve points out, are the structure. The architecture is a structure. The architecture is structure and engineering all as one. So it's a bit labored in that sense. Uh, but, you know, we thought there was, there was a point to make. Um, you know, we're not going to conform and fit in and, and whatever with that intellect. We'd rather do something else. Uh, so that tells you the story as you approach the building. At ground level, you then get a series of other details. And those are the sort of tactile details that you literally touch and sit on or pass by that might tell you something else. Uh, so some of you will know somebody called Edward R. Ford, who's done the modern details, five modern details. Uh, in his opinion, three of them are, are completely Ill illegitimate. So you know the idea. Of, so for him, anything that looks like a sealed, um, um, I won't mention the projects, but anything that looks very slick, you know, giant building with this slick surface that seems to have just arrived from space. I used to work in those sort of practices, and that's, that was one of my jobs, to make it look like it's perfectly sealed. Is it legitimate for him? Because really, you're lying about how that building's put together, the components. You're doing vast amounts of effort of materials and structure and sealants uh, and rubbing and repainting to make it look like it was um, <laughs> a, 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 a monolithic material. So for him, the legitimate um, details are the articulated detail, so, you know, you're expressing how the building's put together, which is that um, semper idea of joining, binding, and completing, uh, but also what he calls the autonomous details, the, the, the details that don't seem to have anything to do with the building at all. They're just sort of random bits here and there. But really what they are is, whether it's a hand, door handle or, you know, gate handle, etc. they allude, they tell you a bit of narrative. So here... Uh, some of you will know the church opposite is St. James. Any Spanish people here? <coughs> no? No. Again, I can make it up again. <laughs> it's not you again, is it? <laughs> okay, what's St. James in Spanish? San Jaime. San what? San Jaime. <laughs> I don't know, I got something else the other day. Santiago? Santiago. Oh, thank yeah. God for that. I keep thinking I've made it up. <laughs> All right, Santiago. So what happens when you go to Santiago de Compostela, when you go on the Camino? What happens there? Huh? Yeah, there's a clear there. Yeah, yeah. shells, yeah, scallop shells, yeah. <laughs> Have you? Yeah. Right, okay. All right, so underneath St. James is St. Mary's Chapel, the original Catholic chapel for the nunnery, when St. James just went, you know, the new, the new um, Protestant one. Uh, and when you go to Santiago de Compostela, you take the uh, camine and you have the shells, and you say, oh, it's tradition, isn't it? It's just tradition. But where did it come from? I don't know, it's just tradition. Uh, and of course, they've done archaeological digs, and what they found is there's a temple to Venus. And Venus is born in the underworld, brought up on a scallop shell, isn't she? Yeah, does anybody know the Botticelli painting? Venus, yeah? I keep doing this, so I have to do a quick impression of this. <laughs> yeah, see? You've recognized it now, haven't you? <laughs> well, there used to be pilgrimages to Venus, the, the Temple of Venus, and uh, you took the scallop shell as a blessing. So all around a littered scallop shell. So it's an appropriation, isn't it? The, the Santiago de Compostela, the, the, the Camino, is an appropriation of an old system, as it were. So really, this is just telling you that, um, that St. James is sitting on top of St. Mary's, uh, Venus is actually uh, the temples of Venus pinch the Ionian Greek fe uh, temples to the Greek female goddesses and our building which apparently is so shockingly modern and new and contemporary and oh my god it doesn't fit in is just Stonehenge isn't it it's megalithic except on several stories the only difference is that nylon plate that is the thermal isolation 
I think that's set on clock. Oh, yes, some interiors. That's our office. It's going to get slightly boring and a nice Tim saw shots now. <laughs> um, okay, the open floor plate. All the petitions are in there. Are, uh, and this initially comes out of pragmatic um, uh, desires. You know, you're working with your first fix and second fix. I'd like a full height door. Oh, yeah, 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 first fix. Yeah, that'll cost you extra for this. Second fix, oh, yeah, that'll cost you extra for that. I'm not doing it until first fix does this, that, and the other. You think, oh, God, this is absurd. Why don't I just get rid of first fix altogether? Because it's all aluminium petitions, plasterboard. They um, skim it, paint it, and then um, cabinetry comes along and hides it anyway. You think, well, I'll just get rid of that. I'll get the carpenters to put in timber studs and line it all in timber, and the cabinetry is integral to that. And as long as you meet your acoustic separation between flats as well as um, rooms, you get the carpenter tells you, guess what? I can get a full height sheet without doing anything to it. It doesn't cost you any extra. And the other thing is, it's all timber. Literally everything is timber. So it, it's, um, it's, it's embodied carbon. Dare I say it's negative, but we can come on to that. I've got, yeah, I'm running out of time. <coughs> More Tim's saw shots. The roof, water attenuation. Green, sorry, I'm wrapping up. I don't know, I don't, you've got somewhere to go. <laughs> I've come from Bristol for this. <laughs> uh, uh, water attenuation. Obviously, all of us have two criteria, biodiverse and water attenuation. They don't normally overlap. The Venn diagram doesn't overlap. Two different departments. Please tick, tick, tick the box. Biodiverse roof, some wild grasses and a couple of sad looking bits of log in the corner, apparently, to uh, attract invertebrate insects. And what do you do for water attenuation? Another sub-basement with its own um, uh, pump, because it allows the groundwater to come in. The pump takes the groundwater out into a sewage system, but the attenuation has to be lined with its own pump and lots of infrastructure. QS is, you know, remember, I'm acting cl as client as well as architect, and I'm saying, how much for water attenuation? Ah, oh, you know, X amount. It's just incredible, the, the logic of this there. Why? Just to tick that box. Can't we keep the water on the roof? Yeah, it's called a blue roof. Okay, that's it then. Blue roof and green roof, simple. Landscape architect, this is the important thing about making sure your design team's around that table. Posh landscape architect called Look, Pot, Todd Longstaff. Uh, I'm meeting the Prince of Wales. I mean, I need to go. I'm sorry, Todd, but you're being paid to be here. You're going to stay to the end. Okay. And of course, right at the end of the agenda is the M&E engineer who's then saying, yes, um, slash sustainability. Uh, yeah, okay, you can keep all the water on the roof. Uh, uh, and then Todd says, ah, oh, but your, your wild grasses won't be drinking all that water. All right, what do we do then, Todd? Just put a nice big oak tree, 20 meter oak tree. And the engineer's saying, well, you can't do that because your slab increases, we have to redesign it, etc. all the stone gets bigger. And Todd says, well, what about four trees? And if you put them to the perimeter, the engineer says, then we don't do anything with the slab. Pin them all down. And there's our answer. You know, trees, shrubs, on a blue green roof. It's got a, um, um, uh, a solar powered irrigation system. It's gone completely bonkers. And it's far cheaper. Uh, and I proselyze about, about that all the time. So I would highly recommend doing that. Right, I'm almost there. We did this new Stone Age exhibition. We asked Canary Wharf, and actually Durban as well, just for some advice. Look, give us your optimum. We want to see whether it's possible. Canary Wharf said, we don't, ideally, we don't want anything more than 30 stories, X by Y in plan with a core so large, with a span, or a clear floor span of, I can't remember, was it 12 meters? Uh, uh, that allows multi-let or single tenancy. Turned out you could do it. We thought, well, 30 stories was ambitious, but it's possible. For that, we had um, eight associate sustainability engineers who then worked out if it was a steel frame, obviously it's embodied carbons a lot, concrete's a bit less. If everything is stone, so that's all the exoskeleton and those pre-tensioned floor plates that you saw, Steve, then it's obviously a fraction, isn't it? A fraction of the steel and a fraction of the of the um, of the uh, of the concrete. What happens if you replace the floor plates with CLT, and you do the your timber petitions in in um, in uh, well, internal petitions in timber? Well, eight associates. Oh, it's carbon negative. Oh, oh, that's another reason for doing a hybrid. Turns out to be slightly cheaper. And um, and uh, 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 well, let me just jump to the cheapness of it. 
uh, Jackson Coles at the time. Uh, where, where are we? Yes, so at that time, you know what it's like. One year concrete's more, one year steel's uh, more. So at that time, concrete was slightly more than steel. The all stone version was cheaper, and then um, the stone and timber was cheaper still. It's not a vast amount cheaper, but actually, you know, to somebody like Canary Wharf, that sort of cheapness makes a big deal on a project of, of that, that scale. Coming back, remember, this is, this is EN15978. If any of you are interested in the embodied carbon of your building, this is what you have to follow. 50% of the materials, another 4 or 5% building it, putting it together. So 55% of the embodied carbon of your building during its lifespan is the materials and putting it together on site. If you make it carbon negative, that is stone and timber combination, well, it's all for naught if at the end, end of life, it all goes to landfill, rots, and uh, releases its um, CO2. So how do you stop it doing that? You have to do what's called material passporting. So in Amsterdam, they're already doing that. City council's basically saying, anything you build, we, your BIM model, already the QS is using for itemizing everything for cost purposes, and same with your contractor. You have another column for sustainability for embodied carbon. Every single item has a line to it, and every single material, therefore, was identified. That database goes into planning. It's locked in there, on the land, on that building. The next time you come up to, uh, to, to planning, in Amsterdam it's already happening, I'd like planning permission, aha, when do you want to build? Oh, I don't know, in two years time. Well, these three buildings near you are coming up for demolition, we've got the data, please reuse 20% of those materials in your building, in your, redes in your design. Carbon passporter, material passporter, you can count ne the negative, yeah? Otherwise, it's all for naught. Then the rest of it, you have to work on to make sure it's um, not burning vast amounts of energy. So you can design for that. How do you control that? Can you control in a section 106 where they get their energy from? Uh, uh, can you control that they, d they don't write a lease? Because you'll know that if you go around the city, the lights are always on, aren't they? Because currently, leases say, please do not fiddle. And, and um, you're going to probably tell us a bit more about that. Please do not fiddle with the lights or the air conditioning systems. They must be on all the time, running all the time. You can begin to control that. So altogether, you can lower that and hopefully remain negative. So this is one of the ones where we're trying uh, it on site. It's in basalt. It's meant to be CLT. This is one of the ones where a contractor said, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. And then immediately told the project manager, I can do this in concrete much cheaper. And I said, please. Please don't do it, because I, I can guarantee you that it's a con. Of course, of course it's a con. He signed up without asking Steve or me. Just signed up. Client said, oh, I'll do it. It's apparently cheaper than me. Why would I argue? OK, fine. I've warned you. Don't, you know, I don't want to say I told you so six months later. What happened six months later? I mean, why is the, um, the temporary props for the concrete the same price? Well, he gave me the price, and I said, can't be right because that's the same price as a CLT just for temporary propping. Oh, it's an outrage. Yes, yes, it is an outrage. What do I do about it? I don't know. The concrete's being poured. It's too late. <laughs> so, yeah, unfortunately, we live in that sort of world. So, you need, if you can, try and control it. I still find it outrageous on every bloody project we work on. Well, sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, Steve, I won't, I won't mention any more. Um, uh, you know, there's so many of them. <laughs> you go back on site, you think, how the hell did that wall turn into concrete? <laughs> well, the contractor's just rubbing their hands, thinking, I'm making more money, it's another... The other thing is prelims. You know, you're on site with concrete. CLT will go up in eight, eight days, eight working days, yeah? Concrete is months. Oh, the prelims, I mean, it's a 100,000 a month. Yeah, of course it is. That's why they want concrete. Not just that they're taking the money, but the prelims are 100 grand a month. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to... Right, so I think this is the end. We, uh, I managed to get these guys, corralled them into helping at the RCA with a bunch of postgrads, and we said, let's just tackle every bloody building typology. Some of you, hopefully, well, all of you, if you're architects, you'll be w w building on some of these. Normal Taylor Wimpy House. So one of the students took a housing project near him in Oxfordshire. 
breeze block, uh, double skinner breeze block with uh, stone veneer. The stone veneer, Steve worked out, is millimeters from being a little bit bigger. I think it's something like 40 mil. And he said, well, just make it 50. And it, you know, it's only ground plus one. That will support itself, self-supporting uh, skin. Yeah. So it's not performing any structure apart from supporting itself. Brick ties back to a timber frame. Guess what? The embodied carbon is suddenly negative compared to the breeze block and cheaper. And then one of the students said, oh, I want to take on Bishop's Gate. <laughs> so go ahead, go and have a, have a go. Uh, I, I'm still skeptical of whether it's going to be much cheaper. At one point, one of the students did come back and say, it's 99% cheaper. <laughs> that, that'd be interesting. How did you work that out? Uh, <laughs> to rerun that, so, so, some skepticism. <laughs> we had these guys, the, uh, the sustainability engineers and uh, OLP um, uh, cost consultants who were just bamboozled by how the, st the students were literally working out the cubic meters of aluminium and, and glass as opposed to just square meters, <laughs> the rule of thumb. Anyway, Steve had a go at this. It can be built in stone. I mean, if you look, analyze what this building does, it's completely bonkers, the amount of, which is, it's, it's all to do with how the building started on site and then had to be finished and various things. So, but uh, St Steve had a go. I'm basically selling Steve, aren't I? Whatever you do, whatever you've got, houses, towers, <laughs> he's your man, and so is he. <laughs> they had to go Herzog de Meuron again. Basically everything, lower in embodied carbon, uh, is anybody from AKT here? Because I've been having a go with Jerry O'Brien over the last couple of days. He's been saying, no, 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 the future is zero carbon steel and concrete. I said, well, there is no such thing as zero carbon steel or concrete, is there? How can you make steel zero carbon? You know, by definition, it's iron oxide. You need coal in there to draw out the oxygen and release CO2. It's not possible. Uh, okay, it's 500 kilos per cubic meter. Yeah, it's not zero, is it? Anyway, this is AKT, who I used to work with. Oh, sorry, I still do work with. When I worked while I was at Zaha's. So we had a tackle of that as well. It's all going swimmingly. All negative, 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 and even cheaper. And even an airport, um, even a hospital, until we get to the, the bridge. We find out, yes, you can make it in timber and stone, uh, but the price goes up because actually a concrete box beam is still the cheapest thing to do for a, for a bridge. Okay, no, this is definitely at the end. <laughs> Need one of those sticks with a hook to <laughs> I'm, dr I'm dragging myself off. Okay, so that's just, you guys have run through this already, different um, uh, uh, pre or post tensioning for floor plates, beams or lintels, uh, um, um, how you might prefabricate it with a basalt cement at the back and transport it to save time on site. Uh, making use of waste stone. This is an Italian sponsored um, research project with insulation in between. So it's structure, external, internal finish, and insulation. Um, and then using that again as structure as an experiment. This is a diagram you're after. In the States, they sometimes use this much timber to make a four or five bedroom house. Yeah? That requires about that many hectares. Because remember, not all the timber, uh, only some of it will be structural use. The rest of it will be matchsticks, etc. And as Steve points out, it's a fraction if you do all in stone. It's not a binary argument. It's just about saying, you know, at some point, um, you have to have a, a little intelligent thinking about, well, I'll use both materials, but how much of each? Now the key thing is, it's carbon sequestrating, and some of you will have, some of you will know Professor Tom Crowther, whose idea was, we've got 1.7 billion hectares of land that's currently unused uh, around the planet. If we planted that tomorrow, clicked our fingers, planted it tomorrow, within 100 years we'd be at pre-industrial levels of atmospheric carbon. But obviously we're living in the real world, and no one's planting that at the moment. But that's the thought experiment, yeah. Now imagine there's another professor, uh, uh, Rummage, in Cambridge, who says, just by uh, economic demand alone, no legislation, Europe's forests are growing for the timber industry. And they know they have to be more diverse, so there's lots of biodiverse forestry growing. And he said that alone is already swallowing up about 25% of Europe's emissions. 
Now you, you, you overlay Crowther and Rummage and say, let's plant those one seven billion hectares. How much of that is actually in construction? Let's say we had it today, only 30 to 40%. So people always complain about, you have to remember, the UK has got 25 million homes. The world needs 30 million homes every year. Yeah, so there's lots of people, apart from not yet born, but lots of people living in substandard accommodation. So if we manage to show an example of how you can build sustainably negative carbon, they might do as well. Because you, know, you look at most parts of the world, it's concrete everywhere, isn't it? Concrete and steel going up, because apparently we have set the precedent. This is the modern way of, of, of building. Lastly, for those people who really want brick, with Albion over there, there's Michael, please bend his ear, because um, he's never thought of this before. We never thought of it, about it before. We were challenged by um, an affordable housing provider. I'm in an area where I have to use stone. I really want to use stone. It's low embodied carbon, but it's also an area that ha has lots of stone. But I'm being told it's super expensive. And having done that study with the RCA students, we worked out, well, actually, a brick skin, it, uh, if it was a stone skin, is only that deep. How can we do that? What can we do? And Michael over there, Albion Stone, Albion Stone PLC, Limited <laughs> in Portland, uh, worked out. He will sell it for uh, 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 1,500 a cubic meter. Cut. Yep. Now, if you look at your uh, male and female bricklayer diagram, if you lean over 10 kilograms, 15 kilograms, 20 kilograms, 10, or 15, then 10, before you go on scaffold and start again. So you can striate your facade according to 50 mil to 20 kilograms in size of, of block, hence one side is varied. It'll work out a pound, uh, the equivalent of a pound of brick, which is a you know, fairly inexpensive brick. It's not mid-range, it's not high range. It's not nowhere near Peterson, is it? So it's totally possible if you really want the brick look, as in broken up into small variegated facade, as it were, to do it in stone. Oh, yeah, this is what I was doing on oh, design review panel on. 26 stories, lovely gardens, lovely balconies, lots of CGIs and people smiling, babies. <laughs> All right. That's it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions. Um, would Anton Breck... Ah, oh, sorry, Anton. Will you tell us about the reality of these terrible timber <laughs> windows? Um, the reality is, is that they are great. Microphone. Oh, yeah, sorry. The um, they're, they're, they're great. Um, they do blow open a little bit. Um, is, that, is that as good as I should say? Uh, they, they don't leak. They, get, they, they wax and wane with the season. Yeah, they do. They sometimes get stuck and sometimes they don't. But actually, they're, they're still fine and they still work. Is, is that a good and answer? It's, 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 a good, it's a good answer for him. And your general um, enjoyment of, of, of that building and that experience, as in the emotional, you know, the concrete, the stone. Okay, the so, so uh, this has been very fascinating for me, actually, living there, because it's, it's um, from the concept for us, has been much more than actually just living there. Um, for us living inside it, there are things that are very architecturally, um, obviously being the client and... The constructor has been quite amusing. Like so, all the the bedrooms are interconnected, and they have these sliding doors that sound sort of quite amazing. Like all the air can flow through. The intimacy you have by having sliding doors between every single bedroom is quite extraordinary. Um, and so, so there there are things like that. And and some of the to to put things behind all these beautiful wooden veneered poles, you'd actually need to be a six foot two to open the oven. You know, to sort of take out a dish of lasagna. Um, but I mean, these are minor things. I think I think on the whole, we've been quite lucky because we are higher up the building, so therefore I think there's been complaints maybe that it's quite noisy, um, but we are probably the noisiest because I have seven children and we are quite noisy up there, and so I think it's our noise that bothers everybody rather than the other way around. Um, I think that the children, my children who are teenagers, might complain that it all looks quite similar inside because everybody's very aesthetically beautiful and nobody's defaced it or put on their own new front door, which means that they have absolutely burst into other people's flats, maybe rather enthusiastically. And we have had a very sweet old dog who lives downstairs quite often come and if our front door's open, just walked into our flat. You know, so I mean, I, I don't know. I think on the whole, sort of the, the good and the bad... Um, it's, it's very normal life living. It's, it's a very nice building to live in. It's beautiful where we are at the moment because all the trees are out. And it's like living in a grotto. The whole of the wall is just green trees. So it's absolutely beautiful. 
And on the other window, it's like living in a movie. It's like rear window. There's a whole block of flats, and there's a little old lady I like to check. She comes out every every so often because she's quite old, you know, and she hasn't been out on her balcony for a bit. But, you know, so you do see you do see all of sort of all aspects. And then obviously you have the incredible skyline. So for me, the the benefits definitely um, outweigh sort of the, the the bits that are maybe not so architecturally uh, perfect. But me as a non-architecture student don't know all the difference if that makes sense yeah that's perfect thank you very much would anyone have, have any questions for any of the panel question Hi, um, so it's, it's just sorry. they like give you the microphone <laughs> Now that you've, uh, you've gone through this amazing uh, project and it's taken a decade and more of your life, um, how have you uh, re-evaluated your initial um, decisions? How would you look at the building now and how would you redesign it if the opportunity came? I mean, uh, CLT, the concrete frame is an embarrassment. I don't know. We, I think we. Um, no, why do we have? We have timber Can I just beams. Check? It's not a concrete frame, is it? It's a series of floor plates floating on a temporary structure yeah, that are then braced yeah. against so that's the, a skeletal. The so you supports. basically cast all those pieces and. So I, th I think. I mean, personally, I'm very proud of that building because we've made, you know, a load-bearing stone building, and there are other load-bearing stone buildings in contemporary you architecture. You built it not, all, then not brought, brought the load up afterwards. You and the load, yeah. But I think. Um, we, we had a lot of debates at the beginning. We were trying to make CLT work, and the building has supporting facades on four sides, and CLT spans in two directions, and it had just too long a span. And the planning height was kind of limiting it and pushing it down, so we were really struggling. I didn't think you bothered with planning, is that? Well, we, yeah, we, um, <laughs> we have a passing uh, pa Passing interest. To, when I say we, I mean him. <laughs> but I think, I think if we built it, I mean, I think the... It would be a better building if we built it in CLT and a better story. But I think you take these things one step at a time, having a contemporary building in the middle of London with a load-bearing stone facade, I think is a big achievement. And it, and it lays out you know, pipeline for other people to do other things in that, in that regard. And uh, um, yeah. It was actually Timber Joyce. We, so we, we originally tried Timber Joyce, but we struggled with the floor layouts because every floor had different layouts. And uh, you end up with these little because exposed timber joists, yeah. Uh, uh, and we're just being dim. Uh, the thing was on the shelf for a while because we were looking for funding and uh, we then tended out and agreed but we were just looking for funding on it. And then we actually did two CLT buildings and they went up in eight days and I thought, oh, this is ridiculous, what have we done? But it's too late, we've signed up to this chap who's gonna do our concrete floor plates. So we learn, yeah. So that's probably one aspect would, would definitely change, uh, yeah. Uh, so the stiffness was from the core, the stair core and the yeah. lift. So that was stiff. Yeah. Then there yeah. were the floors were basically propped, and then the stone came up at the end and, and picked up the load of the periphery. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think when we're doing... So we do a lot of unusual and kind of slightly innovative buildings, and I like to kind of bite off one innovation at a time and not too many at, at once. Um, so that one, the, the core... Um, takes all the lateral load on the building and the stone columns are only carrying the vertical load so you can leave it there on props temporarily and it's quite safe and you can build the stone around it and you can remove the props afterwards the building we're building in Finchley um, the stone is actually the wind the wind resisting structure and the full hinge is working as a portal frame natural unreinforced natural stone structure which is another step further and um, we need temporary bracing to provide wind stability until the stone is installed at 10 stories, which has been uh, quite a lot more challenging than the original, um, than the original one. But I, I, I mean, I, I actually wish the Finchley one was CLT on the inside. And actually, as I mean says, would have been much easier to deal with had it been an internal lighter weight CLT structure than a concrete structure. So I, I, I mean, personally, I think the combination of stone and timber is great. Wooden floors, stone walls, extremely low carbon, very pragmatic. Who would have thought after 7,000 years of building like that, that after the fossil fuel era, we would be building like that again? And that's really the way to, to go. And um, I think both of these buildings have missed opportunities on the CLT front. But there's so much, you know, coming back to the earlier question, there's so much inertia in contracting, in the culture of building, 
um, that you you know you propose timber and stone solutions in meetings, and there's a sort of Ayn Rand conspiracy that puts you on a list of uh, left-wing designers, engineers, and left-wing engineers proposing timber, wears the sandals, that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah. oh, thank you. Um, f the the other thing as well is that. As makers uh, at, at, at the stone masonry company, what was fantastic, the journey that we had with Amin and Steve, is that how compartmented we all trades are, and that um, there, is, um, there is a case for just mixing much earlier in, in the courses at university, the, 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 the engineer, the makers, the, um, the, the architect, because um, since, since Amin got very curious about stone with its team, we just find out that there were a huge uh, hunger by the architect, by the engineers, to learn more about, uh, about where the material come from, especially in the last three years, four years, and, and so on, maybe more years from some other people who were aware of, the, of what was happening to the, to the planet. But um, I, I, I think it, it is time for us to, to work much closer to each other um, so that the engineer architect find a lot more intimacy with the material and where they come from. Uh, and I think that we, something that uh, I, I, I do find very nice with, with Claire Kenwell Close is that it reconnects us to material, okay? And how disconnected all of us since for the last 50 years have been disconnected in the way we make things. And that's the, the climate emergency, emergency or, or, or so on. The sustainability argument is, is really to suddenly try to think again about how we make things, how they, they, where they come from, and how much energy is taken from all of us to transform these, these buildings. Um, that's it. Can I add one? I mean, one other thing is what, I mean, I, as much as it pains me to say nice things about, I mean, <laughs> after all of these years of fighting over uh, projects, but I mean, it's very generous in the design process and very open to engineers, craftsmen, other architects, designers, you know, very, very open and very open and generous with its credit. And I think that attitude really allows people to come into those projects and to, you know, to really pave, uh, pave the way for interesting solutions, whereas more controlling architects extinguish the input of, uh, of other people and you really end up with totally aesthetic solutions. And I think that, that really is uh, what you can see in this. Uh, we had, um, there was a, a, um, an event with David Chipperfield who was asking what next. One of the, one of the, t the, the sort of subtext was participation. And uh, most of us understand community participation, i.e. it's going to influence the design in that way. And uh, I was, I think I was asked basically because to, to argue about participation with everybody else, the design team. So the engineer, all the other design team members, m and &E, sustainability, and the materials, whatever those materials are. Uh, and my argument was that, as Steve says, it's not about feeling somehow generous. It's actually saying, well, you know what? I think I'm confident enough to be able to take a step back, let these guys begin to dictate how this building might be put together for less money, less uh, embodied carbon. Does it make sense? And I can step in occasionally and say, oh, yeah, well, that's not quite right. Why don't we do this or that? And you might just, that might be the architect's role, the team leader, as it were, without saying, I have a vision. It should look like this. I need a team now to put whatever steel columns are behind that vision. Oh, God. Yeah, but I've used so much brick and stone in that vision, it could actually hold itself up, but I don't care. Just get on with it because whatever, that's how we do it. Yeah. So it, it's, that is a takeaway, hopefully, from this, to get the rest of the team the material people, yeah, the people who actually make the stuff, uh, who, who are hopefully the engineering and the architecture combined. Otherwise, it will be handed over to a structural engineer who normally will say, well, I love the vision. We'll put steel or concrete columns here. What does the QS say? Oh, concrete's cheaper this year. Sprinkle it about. And so many schemes you walk up, and they've got so much brick in front of a concrete column that's about a meter away. You think, well, what the hell's the concrete column doing there? Well, yeah, well, it's just the normal process, isn't it? You hand it over to the design team. The engineer has just said concrete here, and the QS has chosen concrete instead of steel, et cetera, et cetera. One thing I would, two things, because you, you, you just mentioned it, and suddenly it occurred to me, uh, that you also never need to do, uh, try and avoid. I've had an obsession with up and over you know, windows. Um, 
I must have an up, <laughs> it's my own scheme, I'll do one which acts like a balcony, it's sort of a balcony level, yeah, and they, they pivot. You can, they pivot at height, they've been balanced to counterweight pivot on a gas strut as well, because just to <laughs> so, perfectly horizontal, yeah, yeah, but um, obviously they don't quite do horizontal. And uh, one, you know, I was thinking, what, why is it so loud? I mean, I'm listening to, you know, you've got seven kids, happy birthday. Every, you know, it's less than every couple of months, isn't it? <laughs> happy birthday! And as much as I love that, I was thinking, but yeah, but why is it so loud? It, can't, it just can't be. I mean, it can't be coming through the floor. It's just, you know, and you realize, oh yeah, my window's open. And you're looking outside, you realize this bloody great bit of glass, that big, is at an angle, and it's just going bounce straight down <laughs> into, into our room. And then there's wooden panels. I've put them directly behind the columns, instead of you know in front of in front of the um, the opening, as it were, to sort of half open, half half behind the column, hide them. And uh, one day I was just sitting there, you know, <laughs> enjoying the breeze, listening a conversation upstairs, like a whispering gallery, because it was hitting the stone and going din -din 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 and coming back out. So yeah, don't put your windows behind the stone columns. Don't, don't have, yeah, just don't have a cigarette. <laughs> I think on that high note of acoustic uh, abuse, we, we should um, wrap up. But if there's one final question, I'll take it. Otherwise, I'll, I'll close out. Question over here. Thank you very much. Hi there. Um, so I, I still have two questions, sorry. Uh, but basically, the first question I had was that um, when in, those, in the projects that you've done with stone, has there been any difficulties with the transportation of stone compared to other sort of materials? And the second one is that, sorry, uh, is that when looking at, I guess, the transportation itself, do you feel like there needs to be any kind of more change, especially if you want to do any more projects that maybe are more at a longer distance or maybe more remote than the current projects in London. Uh, but yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a quick easy answer then, Pierre. Uh, um, when we finished, our sustainability engineer said, I've worked out that you've saved 92% of your embodied carbon instead of doing a steel building clad in stone. Uh, uh, oh, God, bloody hell, you know, 92%, we thought it might be 20. Yeah. Have we done that? Just think about it. I mean, just just think about it. it. I'll give you a clue. It would have been, it would have been 97 had you not transported it from France. Yeah. So that's sort of your answer. That transporting it from roughly Lyon to London added an extra five percent on the embodied carbon compared to had we got it from, from where's Michael over there? Had had Michael not told somebody, oh, we'll just drill a hole in it and put a steel column in. Uh, so yeah, I'll leave Pierre. So um, yes, um, it, it, it has a cost on carbon and, and on price as well. Um, we have decided now to um, to uh, to organise our shipping uh, in a sort of 800 kilometres radius around London, uh, because the further uh, quarry you have in in Scotland is 800 kilometres. So if you want something that comes from Britain, you might as well take it from France, just around the corner, um, and. Um, and, and we do believe that uh, we used to, 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 to have some, some stuff coming from Italy, from, from Spain, from Portugal, and we've stopped that and, and go closer, closer to, uh, to the source. So that's why now we've, we've been working with, with Albion Stone. Um, again, through what we learn with, with, uh, with Claire Kenwell, uh, of offering to the client a full range of stone rather than an over-selected material. That means that you, by over-selecting it, you, you just push the, the um, I call that uh, the, the wasting and and the and, and, and the amount of unloved stone um, and uh, by doing so with architect who are keen to to understand that their building is going to be governed by the quarry rather than than by them in a way to give a bit more uh, um, power to the quarry um, then you know we, we can we can try to see if we can push again the uh, the, the quarry industry of dimensional stone at a much bigger uh, level uh, in, in the UK but uh, for the moment yes we try to to stay in these 100 kilometers 800 kilometers thanks I think that was a good question to end on because I think the whole talk obviously very illuminating we're going to continuously have to recalculate and rethink these things. I don't think the mileage that we currently work out in materials is correct. Lots of things are wrong. New hybrids will come forward, new ways of working with people, new ways of thinking about architecture in terms of 
what resources have I got within what distance that I can move it in what way and how do I assemble them, which will lead to new contracts and a whole new way of thinking about things, which I think puts architecture powerfully in an open and collaborative way with everyone else, architecture rather than architects, back at the center of the conversation. But it becomes an idea about sort of developing a new low carbon vernacular. And I think that's a great essay in that. And obviously, despite the singing, you've had lots of children, so things must be going well there. So, um, but thank you to uh, Steve, Pierre, um, Amin and Anton for a very illuminating uh, story of a, of a material, a production process, an attitude, and in the end, a delightful place to live. So thank you all very much.